Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Championship Conversation. I'm your host, Cassius Swimson, and today I have a very, very, very special guest here on the show with me. Usually, I like to read my guest's resume off to you guys, but this guy's resume is so stacked and so packed that I don't want to miss anything, and I want you to read it for yourself. Take these next few seconds to read about my guest. Please help me welcome our guest on the show today, Northwestern's new athletic director, Dr. Derek Gregg. Dr. Gregg, did I miss anything? No, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to memorize it all, but I had a little trouble. I think I got most of it down, though. You did. You did. You did a good job. Okay, thank you. So, Dr. Gregg, this is no normal interview. Matter of fact, I don't even like to call my things interviews. This is just a conversation between two friends. I would like to start this conversation with my first question. I watched your press conference. First off, congratulations on Northwestern. You did a Thanks. great job. I feel like you answered every question way better than I would have. <laughs> so I saw where you mentioned going into Vanderbilt. You had a football scholarship, a Pell Grant, and a praying mom. And most people don't understand how important that last thing is a praying mom going in go into detail about having a praying mom and how that has shaped your life first of all that's a great question I appreciate you having me on here and and uh you and I go back to you being born which mm -hmm. is amazing uh but having a praying mom is important you know about that coming up in a household where Christianity is very important I came up in a uh, in the south and my mom has always instilled the, the spirit of the Lord in us and to, and to be led by him. And so all of the things that you read in my bio, I fully understand that a lot of those things are all of those things. They don't have really anything to do with me. They just have to do with the journey that God has placed me on. And in the meantime, I'm able to bless other people, in particular young people your age, that, that come onto these college campuses and uh, some of them, you know, in, in today's world, they have a lot of challenges. And so being able to help guide young men and women to what they're going to be. And when they see me, they see something that they can become. But I always understand that that's because God has placed me in this position. And I'm not really shy about that. I know it's not popular to everybody. But for those who do grasp that concept, I think they really, really resonate. And then those who don't, they can still see the hard work, the education, and some of the things that I talk about that athletics has brought into my life. And if it weren't for me being able to play football very well and go to the college that I went to that I never would have been able to go to because my family couldn't afford a school like that, um, then I always talk about that piece as well because it's very important. Speaking of that athletic career at Vanderbilt, what are some things that you learned not only playing at Vanderbilt, but going back and being an academic counselor that you that you will be able to use for this upcoming journey? Well, the, at a place like that, obviously education comes first. And I've worked at a lot of different institutions and what we wanna first do is make sure that kids go to class, educate themselves and graduate. And so at a school like Vanderbilt or Northwestern school, you're going to Michigan, academics is placed in, on a high, high pedestal. And we have to always focus on that first. So I learned that as a student athlete because when they recruited us, they really kind of recruited us. This was the days that you're accustomed to, all these academic support systems. Your father worked in an academic support system. You're accustomed to that. But when I was coming up, that wasn't really within the NCAA rule book. We didn't have to have an NCAA uh, educational support system at Vanderbilt. But after our first semester, myself and four or five of the guys that I played with, we went to the coaches and said, hey, you guys better create some type of academic support system around us, or we're not going to make it here. Mm -hmm. Playing time college athletics and then trying to compete in the classroom with some of the best and brightest minds across the world that was a very very tough thing to do so we're able to help them really to almost force them to create that academic support system that I ended up going back and started my first job at so I'm very proud of that I saw in a quote where you mentioned you would sit down with President Shapiro and all the coaches to map out everything that you think can happen over the next five to 10 years. Can you share one major thing that is in that map over 
the next couple of years or is first on that priority list? Uh, absolutely. And the athletic director prior to me, Jim Phillips, good friend of mine, did a great job and really he turned Northwestern into what I call a modern day big time athletic director program or athletic program. So some of the pieces I'm talking about is we have to uh, create a strategic plan. And so I'll hire, one of the first things I wanna do is hire a chief of staff that will help pull that process together and we'll start mapping out what we're going to do. Sight unseen, you don't wanna always just list a bunch of things you think need to be done. But you were a big advocate for name, image, and likeness. Now that it's July and that's in effect all over the country, what do you think that will do for the student athletes? Well, I think it's something that's long overdue. It's something that I always talk about. 30 years ago when I was a student athlete, we weren't privy to those types of things. And so I was able to fortunately uh, go to the Illinois governor's signing of the state NIL bill about a week ago and went over and represented Northwestern, even though I'm not officially, I wasn't officially on the clock then, I'm officially on the clock now. And being able to interact with the student athletes who were there that spoke on behalf of the other student athletes and how much it means to them. And, um, and now you're already seeing some of these endorsement deals are already coming to fruition, which probably they were sitting there, some companies were sitting there waiting on these things to become legalized, but it's already taken effect. And I just think anytime that as a former student athlete that we can do something for the current student athletes to help them build their own name, image, their brand is what they're really building into the future. I think that's very positive. We just have to make sure that people are doing it the right way and that people aren't getting taken advantage of. There are only 10 black athletic directors in the power five conferences combined. This is a two part question. One, what is it like to be able to be one of the only ones in the country? And two, how can we take steps forward to get more diverse in positions like head coaches, athletic directors, and presidents for our colleges? Yeah, that's a great question. The first part is it's very significant, and I don't shy away from that. I always talk about it. Some people don't like to embrace maybe becoming a first or a pioneer, but myself, I was raised by a mother who helped integrate a high school back in 1965, deep South Alabama, where we're from, with a handful of other black students. So it's in my blood and everywhere I've gone in my career, I've basically been a first. You talked about Arkansas. I went there 21 years ago and I was the first black senior administrator that, was, that ever worked in that athletic department. And fortunately for me, Coach Broyles, he brought me on there and he also hired Nolan Richardson. So he did some things along the diversity and inclusion lines that were big. But when I went to Tulsa, I was a first. And going into Northwestern, again, I'll be a first. So again, that gets back to when student athletes see me, especially the ones that look like me, they see something that they can become. So that's significant. The second piece is, and you mentioned me working in the NCAA office for a short period. My title there was Senior Vice President for Inclusion, uh, Education, which is Leadership Development and Community Engagement. And so I was the NCAA's Chief Diversity Officer and we talked about ways to diversify our uh, workforce all of the time. People of color, women, uh, people with disabilities, the LGBTQ community. And it's really about inclusion. It's about making sure that first our pools of people that we're selecting from are diverse. And then the selection committees, they need to be diverse too, because if you don't have diversity on the selection committees, it's hard for people who are all the same color or nationality or creed to see anything differently. So you have to make sure that you really scrub and look at and, uh, you know, and measure your guidelines for hiring people. So I think that's very, very important. And what you're seeing right now is what people would probably call a boom in, in people of color being hired, particularly uh, on the men's basketball side, men's basketball, division one basketball. A lot of African-American men have been hired as opposed to in, in more recent years. Uh, and in women, you talk about a lot more women are being hired. I think the stat is maybe 31 out of 36 on the division one level, women's basketball coaches are women or new hires this year. So those are things that we're making progress in, but we have to continue to monitor them, continue to have the NCAA has what is called an, eight, an eight point plan, really looking at these things. There's something called the leadership collective that the NCAA, that was under my umbrella. That's a big warehouse or a database for uh, minority candidates that presidents and other people can access 
to go to to make sure that they eliminate the myth of there are not enough minorities out there that we can put in these positions. And uh, one more thing. You see, I don't know if you can see them, but there's nine great men behind me, Chadwick Bozeman, Kobe Bryant, Malcolm X, Dr. King, Muhammad Ali, Barack Obama, Thurgood Marshall's right behind me, Jackie Robinson. Oh, and Tupac. Tupac's <laughs> up there too. So these are all people that inspire me, especially Muhammad Ali. That's why he's in the middle. The Cassius, I mean, Cassius Clay. That's right. <laughs> but I just want to know, a shout out John Thompson. I see him, he's in your background. I just want to know who or what inspires you? Well, you know, who inspires me most is my mom. And that's because my biological father wasn't around. He wasn't in my life. And that's not um, atypical. A lot of us come from that type of background. And so uh, I, I hope you never take for granted having your dad in your life. I think that's very important, which is why I and my brother tried to become great fathers and continue to do that, try to do that every day. But really it's my mother. She is the person, but she also did a great job of surrounding me with great male figures. And, and not, even though my father wasn't in my life, my father's dad was in my life. And so my mom understood how important that was. That was a very important man. Our stepfather, I don't like using the word step, but he's the man who raised us, very, very important. And then my Uncle Bill, who was uh, an army man, 25 years, like just great, great men that I grew up around. They love sports. They love to support us. My mom loved education though. She could care less about sports. So I grew up in a very dichotomous household. My mom loved education. The man who raised me, my dad loved sports. And so it was a great combination coming up in that environment. Okay, so that's it right now for all the serious questions here on Championship Conversation. Like I said earlier, this is just a conversation between two good friends. I like to get to know, not the person, not on a serious level, but I like to know their fun side too. So we're gonna get into some fun questions here. Right. Living near Chicago, what are you most excited about being close to that city? Well, Chicago, they call it the second city because it's just a great city. If people haven't been there next to New York City, Chicago, I put them in the same boat. So what's been fun already is that just the people I've interacted with, and I've never been starstruck, so it's, but it's been really good to get to know Michael Wilbon, for instance, who uh, I know you know a whole lot about. He went to Northwestern, and mm -hmm. so He's also on our board. So I got to meet him at the board dinner. They set him right next to me. We had dinner about two or three weeks after that. Uh, fantastic. I was also in a restaurant the other day with the president, the head coach, and, and all the front office people for the New York Knicks. And so these are people that I'm getting to come in contact with now. And again, I, I feel like it's, it's people in this connection, but it's God put me in these rooms with these what I call important people just to be able to learn more from them. You know, never get to the point in your career and your life where you think you know everything and you can't learn from people. And so it's just it's just been great. And I can tell, um, and you know, I wanna meet Barack Obama. That's that's one of the people up on the wall. And I think uh, we'll get a chance to do that. He and, his, he and his wife, obviously the first lady being from Chicago. I think at some point we will be in the room with them. I think we will be in the room with Oprah Winfrey and, and Stedman at some point. And so just to be in the room with those types of inspirational, influential people, I consider that to be fun and, and I can't wait. I know you don't really get that much free time, but when you do, how do you like to spend it? Well, you know, I'm a music person. A lot of people, a, a little known fact about me is I used to be in a singing group in college. And uh, I'm not gonna sing anything, but I was a really, really good dancer. So I was a choreographer. I, I liken myself to Otis Williams with the Temptations who always kept the group together. He wasn't out front, but he's still the only original member of the group that's still alive and still keeps the group going. So that was the way I was. So I love music. You mentioned Tupac, I love Tupac. You know, he would have been 50 years old back in on June 16th, I think was his birthday. And um, as a matter of fact, if I could reach it, I have a Tupac magazine that I picked up yesterday in Barnes and Noble. Um, but that's, that's what I love. I love music. Um, I love movies. And, and that's what I'm gonna miss about this house. We finally, and you got a chance to be in the house. We have a theater room in this house that I'm gonna have to give up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're moving to, to Chicago, but I love being able to be down there. And I don't have a lot of time, like you said, I've only probably been in that, that uh, theater room four or five times, but 
I love music and film. I love entertainment. And for me, it goes back to, I always wanted to be on stage. Mm -hmm. And so now, like I told, I tell my own kids, it's like, now I'm on stage just in a different way. And so, uh, you know, use what God gave you and, and maximize who, who, who put you uh, here to be. Well, like David Ruffin told Otis, ain't nobody come to see you, Otis. I'm the one selling the records. <laughs> that's right. But Otis is still the one that's in the group. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's true. David <laughs> Ruffin got kicked out. Otis didn't. <laughs> okay, so I know you're a grill master. What is the best meal that you think you cook on the grill? I think um, I got this from mom, too. I think it's ribs. And she taught me, and all, all you ribs people out there, Never put pepper on your ribs on the grill because they'll make them cook too fast and it will burn them. Mm -hmm. So put your seasoning salt and stuff on there, grill them up. And then when you pull them off, if you like pepper, put the pepper on. So that's like a little known secret. And so I, I love that. My wife likes me to grill salmon. Another secret, don't overcook your salmon. Don't, you know, get it on a few minutes on one side, a couple minutes on the other, get it off. Don't make, make sure that you don't overcook it. But I just love the grill. That's something I got from my grandfather, my mom. Um, just another, you know, Southern culture, cultural thing that we always did. And I've only barbecued at this house once because we've only been here about six months. So uh, I'm looking forward to maybe getting on the grill when we get up to Chicago next summer because I won't have time to do it once we hit the ground running. Okay, so for these next couple questions, these are just off the top of your head. It's it's either or it's an either or question. So okay. you got to pick the first one: March Madness or college bowl season. Ooh, you're gonna get me in trouble. I, I I'm a football guy, you know, by, by heart and by heart. I love March Madness though. So, but if I had to just choose one, I got I got to go with the the football bowl season. Well, you know, I'm gonna have to disagree with you on that. <laughs> no. Basketball guy, March Madness. You know, I got Kobe Bryant up there. I don't have oh, absolutely. football plays there. Absolutely. Okay, so earlier you mentioned you love music, Jodeci or Drew Hill? I got to go with Jodeci. Jodeci, and I came up on them, it's funny. My wife was watching a video of herself from back in 95 that I found somewhere. It's amazing what you find when you move mm -hmm. and, and throw it in. We still had the old um, camcorder that we plugged into the television and it popped up and um, she was riding around with some of her buddies and they were playing Jodeci. And I was like, man, that's crazy. That's like the, the one of the soundtracks of our lifetime. So I, I like Drew Hill, but I, I got to go with Jodis. Okay, so I feel like I already know the answer to this question because you mentioned earlier how much you love this guy, but Tupac or Biggie? Tupac. <laughs> Tupac all day. Even though Tupac was, Tupac was, you know, and Biggie, they probably both were ahead of their time, but I think Tupac really... When I think about someone, if those two gentlemen were still alive today, I think that Tupac would probably have made a much more impactful, uh, you know, much more impact on society today, just because of the way he was built, who his mom was, his his background. And I think his stepfather is still in prison today for, for some of the radicalism from back in the day. So that's unfortunate. But I think um, just Tupac, I just wish... Um, he's a guy who I've been around guys like that too in my life who are so volatile and he was a Gemini and some people believe in signs and he had two sides to him or more sides to him. And I bet if he was still alive, he wishes he could talk to his younger self mm -hmm. uh, voice some of those things that, that led to his ultimate demise. But, but uh, both of them are great hip hop. And I always say, and they are still alive, but I always tell guys your age, all the best rappers are older than 35 years old. So remember that. <laughs> I'm a big, I'm a big '90s guy anyway. I think Big <laughs> and Jay Z are on the top three anyway. Got gotcha, you, got gotcha. you. What is what is your favorite Tupac song? Oh gosh, um, it'd be hard to choose one. It's a lot of them. Um, the, I think I think you got to go with Dear Mama though. For okay. Me. Yeah, well, yeah, you're a, you're a mama's boy. So yeah, I'm, I was about to say I'm getting back to being a mom's boy, and I I think about that. And, you know, she my mom wasn't on drugs like his mom was, but just some of the things that she went through, some of the things that we saw her being a single mom for a while and having mm -hmm. to raise, and all when I look back on all the sacrifices because I've sacrificed myself and so has my wife, but we didn't have to sacrifice the way that my mom did. Uh, but I, I love that, and I love uh, it's so many of his songs. 
And and even the the diss raps were good too, but they were just too volatile. Yeah, they're very volatile. Just a little bit too personal, you know. You know, working with the scraps she was giving, Mama May right. miracles every, every Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> I think my favorite Pac song is probably "So Many Tears" or "To Live and Die in L.A." Then those two, those two battle back and forth for my. But I'm going to keep it rolling. You mentioned films also. So now I got to ask you about some films. Are we are we rocking with The Temptations or The Five Heartbeats? Oh, The Temptations all day. That's my oh, favorite. Nah. The temptations. And I mean, oh. The Temptations, that's a real group. <laughs> yeah, but Eddie Kane tore the house down when he yeah, started. I give it to Eddie, but, but Eddie's just a spinoff of David Ruffin, just like you said. So Temptations, and um, I love New Edition. Those yeah. Favorite ultimate groups and the Jacksons, of course. Jacksons, yeah. Okay, so Harlem Nights or Life? Life. Okay. Fresh Prince of Bel Air or Martin? Who I think I gotta go with Fresh Prince just because I just love Will and, and what he's done for the culture. Not to diss Martin, because I've seen Martin live a couple of times and um love his movies too. But but Will Smith, just the just his impact on I keep going back to impact on the culture impact on the world you don't get any bigger than will okay bad boys or men in black bad boys it's a little too violent the second one in particular but uh i love bad boys and i love the way those guys play off of each other mm -hmm. um, imagine being on the set with those dudes okay boys in the hood or menace to society boys in the hood <laughs> the jefferson Go ahead. No, no, what were you going to say? I was going to say it's just one of those iconic moment movies that you look back and being at, at my age around that time, it really resonated with me, even though I'm not from out that way. But, um, you know, know a lot of guys who came up like that. So, yeah, boys in the hood all day. I got two more for you. Just quick right. answer. The Wood or The Best Man? Best Man. I, I see we're not going to agree on anything. <laughs> I see we're not going to agree on anything. Okay, last one. And this is a this is an older one. The Jeffersons or Good Times? Oh, Good Times. Okay. I, love to see, I love to see people, our people come up. But I think I love Good Times so much because of the James character and the father figure. Again, I keep going back to that and how no matter how poor they were, he was really the rock of the family. And it was just a shame that they killed him off on the show for political reasons and money and all that other stuff that I've kind of heard about. But um, just to be able to see a strong black man as a big lead in a show back then when I was kind of coming up, I think it's very powerful. Okay, so those are, uh, thank you for all those quick answers. You you had some, you had some okay answers. I, I personally <laughs> wouldn't agree with most of those, but you know, this is about you, not me. You just like your dad. <laughs> 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 last, last question right here, Dr. Gray. I know we are far from the end for you. I know you got a long line ahead of you, but whenever you leave this game, what do you want the legacy of Dr. Derek Gregg to be? Well, you know, it's a couple of things. It's important to me that people know that I always care way more about everybody around me than myself. And that's true. I've never been self-promotional. All the great things that have happened in my career, to me, they're built off of all the people around me. I was able to pull people together and put people in the right positions. And you know, then we had God and then you have some luck. But I always would want to be known as someone who was selfless, who gave a lot more than he got. And that's really the, the track that I'm on. So at the end of the day, I've even said this, maybe on my, my, my headstone, um, just put leader on it. You know, dad um, and leader. And that's what I want to be known for. And husband, of course. Husband, <laughs> husband dad, and leader. But, but really, that I gave more than I got. Those are, those are some great themes to be known as. I mean, I can personally say you have, you've given me a lot, you know, like this interview and couple of trips to March Madness. So Dr. Greg, I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for joining the conversation. A new segment that we have here on Championship Conversation though is we let the current guest pick our next guest. But the catch is 
they have to help us get that guest on the show or in contact with the guest. So who would you like to see the next guest on co- Championship Conversation be? Wow, it, it could be maybe, uh, i tell you a mentor of mine that's great is Kevin Warren, who is the commissioner of the Big Ten, first black commissioner of the Big Ten. Mm-hmm. It, though, but I can, we can see, can we get him? And then I'm just thinking about maybe some of the other athletic directors, the athletic director at Auburn, Alan Green, is a good friend of mine. Tim Duncan is someone I know we can get on, the athletic director at New Orleans, who's fantastic. He calls himself the original Tim Duncan. Yeah, the original, yep. Um, played basketball in Memphis, has been in the business about 20 years. And so, uh, you know, those are the three guys that I think of right off the top of my head that maybe we go after Well, next. Dr. Greg, like I said before, thank you for joining the conversation. We had a wonderful conversation. We, we learned today that you're a, not a selfish, but a selfless man. And you have, you're a big family man and you believe in change. And I believe you're like uh, Mr. Shapiro said, I believe you're the best man for the job. Congratulations on the Northwestern job. But I can't leave this conversation without saying one time, go blue. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> can't leave without saying go blue. Like I said, you're the best man for the job. Thank you for today and all you've ever done for me. And Dr. Greg, good luck. Hey, I appreciate you, Cash. Just keep doing what you do. You are a, a blessing. And always remember, you represent yourself and your family before you represent anyone. I know you've been taught that, but I'm proud of you. And go Cats. <laughs> okay, well, this is the end of the championship conversation. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Make sure you like, comment, post, share, retweet, retweet repost it on Instagram, anywhere you can repost it, like it. Make sure you do all that good stuff. More content coming soon. More and more interviews coming up. Once again, we would like to thank Dr. Graff for coming on the show, and I'll see y'all next time.